we have our next session coming up with Eli Schwartz. And my colleague Helen is going to host this session. Helen, the stage is yours and then Eli's. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I will host the session since I'm the SEO expert at Agile Academy. And so um, I wrote to Eli, I think, three, four months ago and asked him via Twitter if he would like to join us. And um, yeah, without much ado, I will give um, to Eli. Um, but before, yeah, some some words about him. I mean, um, he worked for more than a decade <laughs> um, in huge B2B and B2C companies. Um, he helped clients like uh, Shutterstock, Zendesk, Quora, and WordPress. And he was, is, <laughs> head of SurveyMonkey's SEO team. And um, he oversaw there the uh, global operations and helped launch the Asia Pacific office. And um, I think you're married with four kids. So one more than Sora. <laughs> And um, you recently wrote, uh, wrote a book, which is why we are here. It's a product-led SEO. And so, Eli, I will give to you. All right. Let me share the screen. Can uh, you see my screen, Helen? Yes. OK. So first of all, thank you, Helen, for reaching out to me. You reached out to me even before the book published. So I'm honored that you found it interesting enough to invite me without even knowing if the book was good. Uh, and, and now we're, we're months down the road. You know, it's so funny when I, I pick September and you gave me all the different options. I'm like, yeah, September is so far away, but then it comes around the corner. So great to be with you all here today. Uh, I want to talk to you about product-led SEO, which is the, the title of my book, but really is a, a concept I want to share and, and hopefully teach you and share with you a different way of approaching SEO um, that you, you may find interesting. But going back to my title slide for a second. This is my email address. I'm happy to answer emails from everyone, Eli at productletseo.com. Uh, tell me that everything I said was terrible. Tell me my book is terrible. Just email me because I'd, I'd love to hear from everyone and, and anyone. You can also find me on Twitter at 5LE uh, and you can find me on LinkedIn and I don't have to tell you how to do that if you don't know how to do that. Um, <laughs> there, there are other ways to learn those kinds of things. You know, so, just quickly, uh, we see the speaker view of your presentation. Oh my gosh, let's let's fix that. I thought I'd just say it instead of sending you an email. <laughs> Which, uh, all right, hold on a second. That's what happens when you use two screens. I'm gonna kill one screen. you think that all this time in the pandemic, everyone would figure out how to do slides, right? We'll see. One second. The one thing everyone got used to are technical issues. <laughs> yeah, I guess I, everyone is patient enough. <laughs> I, I, would, I would hope so. And, and kids running into the rooms. <laughs> yes. Kids, which, which, dogs, anything. <laughs> it still happen. Okay, tell me if this gets better in a second. Which one do you see? Still Speaker. presenter view with the next slide and the notes. How about now? No change. Now is yeah, now is good. Great. Now is good. Okay. All right. So everyone saw that in uh, small screen before. So now we'll we'll get back to the big screen. So here's my email address. Uh, you already knew my name, so you know how to find me on on LinkedIn. Twitter accounts five le. So um, my book. So I, I wrote this book because. I'd, um, I've been doing SEO now probably about 15 years and I've been a consultant for the last two and a half years. 
working with companies on, on helping them to understand if there's an SEO opportunity, what that SEO opportunity should be and how they should go after it and, and implement it. And I had a different way of approaching SEO that many people had heard before. And they asked me where they could read more and learn more about that. And I didn't have really have anywhere to point them to. They're great blog posts and they're great podcasts, but executives don't want blog posts and podcasts. They want, they want something more tangible. So I started putting together a book and it, it grew into this. Uh, initially, I had hoped to maybe sell 100 books, uh, mostly to my family. And I, I've just been so honored that people actually want to read it. And I, like, I love what Helen did, like hold it and pick it up. And I, I see that tangible book. So thank you so much for buying it. If you haven't bought it, you don't have to, because hopefully I'll give you the quick summary. But if you want to learn more, then it, it is in the book. And that's why I wrote the book. So before we talk about what product-led SEO is, we really need to talk about what product-led SEO is not. So every time I'm on a podcast or in a presentation and I, you know, I need to talk about product-led SEO, it's to me, it's one of those things that's easier to understand if you understand, again, exactly what it is not. So let's talk about how most of the world thinks of, of SEO. And maybe let's call it content-led SEO, and I'll refer to it as that from now on. So uh, I, I hope wherever you are, I know most people are probably in Europe, and I know you have insurance in Europe. Um, but this is, oh, I'm going to use US examples. And again, hopefully they, they translate as well as possible. But say you, you have a startup and your startup is going to be focusing on an insurance product and you want to generate organic traffic. You want to generate search traffic for your, your startup. So you do what most people do, which is you go to a keyword research tool, and it could be any keyword research tool because I personally, I find them to be mostly similar. You're, you're selling insurance. So you go and put the keyword insurance in and it spits back a bunch of keywords. And that becomes your roadmap that you here are the keywords I'm going to create content for. I'm going to optimize based on keyword search volume. And that is my SEO. So next thing you do is you put that in a big list, you go on Upwork, you go on Fiverr, you go on freelancer.com and you find someone to start writing out this content. Again, you have this long list of hundreds of keywords. The similar ones you'll group into the same piece of content, the different ones become different pieces of content. And then once the content is written, you go in and find a link builder and that link builder is now going to uh, build the uh, links on high domain authority websites. So it should be familiar to everyone out there that's done SEO. This is the, the basic process of mo what most people do. Funny thing is I've been doing SEO so long. Uh, it used to be that you just like bought links. Like there was links available for sale and high domain authority blog posts. Now they've changed it to guest posts and it, it has become more authoritative and even bigger media properties are, are doing just this. Now, this is why I don't think this will, th this is the right way to do SEO. Because in my opinion, it doesn't work anymore. It's not unique. Just knowing that uh, you can go in a keyword research tool and spend $99 or whatever it costs you per month. That's not a, that's not a unique way of going ahead and, and doing, uh, doing any SEO. But even more than that, it doesn't really work because you think of what Google is like, I've been, uh, again, like I said, I've been around for a very long time doing SEO and I've, I've seen the changes that Google has gone through. So for anybody not familiar with any of these images right here, the image on the left side is Google Assistant. So uh, Helen mentioned I have four children. So one of my, my youngest is 18 months old and he walks over to every piece of technology and he says, hey, Google, in a, in a toddler voice, it sounds more like cuckoo than Google, but he, he's talking to Google. Like, this is what Google is in 2021. Google understands intent. They understand syntax. They understand toddlers. So to think that you could just like throw a bunch of keywords in and, and fool Google and rank on things and get visibility on things because you've got it on a page, that's a bit far-fetched. Moving over to the right side, the image on the right side is Google Lens. Um, I, I'm a big fan of Android devices because I you know, might live my life on Google. And uh, this week, Google actually updated many Android devices that now, instead of just the phone being powered by search, there's a search bar in every box. There's actually this image right there, a Google Lens box. So Google's trying to train people to search by images. So don't just speak, don't just type, but actually take a picture of something. And from the picture you've taken, you're going to do a search based on that. So this entire idea of like, you need to write as many keywords as possible. You need to use things like um, 
anchor text around images. You need to use alt text around images because otherwise Google won't know what it is. That's not the AI world we live in today. So Google is far, far smarter than anyone's giving them credit for. And then finally, the image in the middle is I, I spent many years, most of my career living in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley. And all over Silicon Valley, Google has hundreds of these cars, Waymo cars. So Waymo is Google's autonomous driving division. And these cars, as far as we know, have never killed anybody. They've never caused any enough damage that they made it to the media. So these cars are actually making intelligent decisions around whether something is a bug that they can just keep driving into, or it's a ball that maybe they should be aware that sometimes a ball goes in the street. And after a ball goes in the street, a person might come in the street chasing it. So it has to drive a little carefully, you know, because I'm always fascinated by AI and fascinated by Google. I may have driven slowly in front of cars like this to see at what point the car was going to decide to intelligently change lanes because me, the person in the front is being annoying and driving too slow to see when that will happen. So these are intelligent, they're using artificial intelligence. So the same company that has this kind of AI that can make decisions like that can certainly say, well, this piece of content written on Upwork is not very valuable, or this link that is in this media property is not very valuable because it's advertorial, it's a guest post. But even more than, than how smart Google is, if you look at the competition around all of the keywords we focus on, so I'm using insurance as an example, and I'm using US insurance as an example. So there are many US insurance companies that have been around as long as Google. And they're not going to just pause because someone has come out with a startup that does insurance slightly differently and they're going to optimize for those insurance keywords. So the reality is just because you use those keywords doesn't mean you're automatically going to rank on those keywords. And there's lots of intent matching around that. So using that old way of doing SEO, which is loading up a bunch of keywords into a keyword research tool, picking the keywords you want to focus on, going onto Upwork and buying that content is not a secret recipe at all. Everyone knows to do that. And this in the, in the real world, I have very rarely ever seen this happen on any sort of competitive keyword. But to me, the biggest issue with this entire concept of like, this is how I'm going to do SEO is that the focus is completely wrong. When people do this, they're going after rankings. They're trying to get visibility on search engines, but no one gets paid for visibility on search engines unless you're Google or even Google doesn't really get paid for visibility on search engines. You have to actually click things. So the metric around, I'm going to create all this content because I'm, going to, I'm now going to build this and I'm going to be visible on search engines and therefore I'm an SEO success to me is putting the focus in the wrong place because you're not driving any revenue off of that. What you should be focusing on is whatever drives revenue. Is it people clicking and then converting? Is it people clicking and then downloading? Just building content for the sake of being visible on Google to me is the wrong thing. But even more than that, all of the things that everyone does around SEO, so they're building content, they're optimizing title tags, they're throwing image alt tags on there, they're deciding how much content should be. Is it a thousand words? Is it 1500 words? Is it 200 words? These are just tactics. They don't ladder into any sort of strategy. Again, like what the focus should be, the focus should be on ultimately winning visibility because winning visibility equals clicks and clicks equals more users and users equals more revenue and revenue equals you getting a raise or you getting more funding or you being a bigger company. That's the strategy. But all these things that everyone usually focuses on around SEO, they're just tactics. I'm going to optimize this title tag because I have to optimize this title tag. I'm going to write this content because I have to optim write this content. It doesn't equate into any sort of bigger business strategy. And on top of that, for many of the things that are considered tactics, I've, again, been see I've seen many, many websites and I've been doing SEO for a really long time. For an older website, like a website that's been around for a few years and has great visibility, I have rarely ever seen any of these tactics give more than a 10% lift year over year. So if your goal is to get a lot of visibility and to grow traffic and to make a big splash in the company, I have usually not seen this happen. And I'm talking like where you already have lots of pieces of content. It's not, it's not about like you have a massive budget and you're going to create lots of content. I, I recently talked to a company that they had a $100,000 per month budget to create content. 
but each of their pieces of content were cost them a thousand dollars. So at the end of the year, the only thing they really did was create 1200 more pieces of content. That is not a good way to get like, again, assuming that they have millions of visits per month, that is not a good way to really increase the amount of traffic they're going to get. So if you're focusing on SEO and using these tactics and you have a goal of getting hundred percent lift year over year, then I don't know that these tactics will really unlock the growth you want. Flipping over to what I call product-led SEO, and we can dig deeper into this, and I want to set the stage for, for the questions that Helen's going to ask, and we can all have a discussion. So product-led SEO does give triple-digit growth, and let's, let's walk into what it is. So when you're doing product-led SEO, and I refer to a product as anything tangible, so it's not that I'm just creating an actual product like a widget that you're going to use. To me, it's a product. It's, it's some expanded scalable content, which we'll give a few examples of what that is. When you're building that, the user becomes the focus of what you're doing and not the search engine. And most SEO tactics, the search engine is the focus because you're trying to understand and uncover the algorithm. And therefore, that is the reason you write those, that content. When you're building a product, let's say you're building a new phone or you're building a new car, you always want to know that there's product market fit. Are there people that are looking for this? Does it matter for them? And therefore I will do it. So when you're doing product-led SEO, is there a user for this? Does a user want this kind of insurance? Is there a need for another kind of insurance company? Is there even a search user looking for this? So in my consulting, I talk to a lot of software companies and most of the time I tell them they shouldn't be doing SEO because there is not really a search user that is going to be looking for that product. From a B2B uh, software standpoint, the way users are going to find products is maybe it's word of mouth, maybe it's through sales, but do they really go onto Google search and say, look for Google Cloud? Is that the way they're going to make the decision? So it's important to know that there is a user, there is a, an ultimate goal around this, and that is why I'm gonna build my SEO efforts. And we'll explain a little bit what that, that product should be. So when it's a product, you want to start with a strategy. So I want to go after this amount of these kind of users. And this is how I'm going to get there. And in 18 months from now, I'm going to have this amount of content, this amount of features for users. You start with something very small. And then when you have that 18 month plan, then you can dial it back and say, well, this is what I need to do in Q4 of this year. And once I do that in Q4 of this year, I know I need to hire these people in Q1. And in Q1, they're going to need to train these other people that are within the company. It's laddering into a much, much bigger picture. And instead of you're thinking about the metrics, how much search traffic am I going to get? Then you want to think about what makes you determine what you're going to build and how you're going to build it and who is important for this. So you need to understand the people. So you're going to create surveys. You're going, and this could be man on the street, person on the street interviews where you go and ask a person if they're really going to use this, if they're not going to use this. I love to use customer data. So if you already have customers, you can see where there's a failing and where there's something else you need to build. Or if you have customer support, you know, you can look into your, your conversations the customers have had with your customer support and say, here's where we need more information. Now to dive deeper into what exactly I mean by product-led SEO, I like to think of these kinds of companies. So TripAdvisor is, is a global company. So when TripAdvisor set out to create what their SEO product was, if they were a typical SEO effort using content-led SEO, they might have said, well, I'm going to optimize for the Waldorf in New York because a lot of people want to look for the Waldorf in New York and I can monetize that traffic like this and they become essentially a travel blog. Instead, TripAdvisor focused on building SEO product. What that SEO product was, it was taxonomy. It was what does that structure of the page look like? And they built that out and they focused most of the efforts on how do they scale this globally? How do they make a page that can review every hotel in every city, in every state and province, in every country in the entire world? And then once they've done that, how do you translate it to every language they're willing to support? And then once you've done that, you can layer on more product features that unlock even more search traffic. And if we were to ever to figure out how to colonize another planet, then TripAdvisor could easily take that taxonomy and that SEO product they've built 
and bring that over to the other planet. They don't need to say, well, let's do our keyword research and figure out how it is that we can optimize for the way people search for hotels on Mars, for example. Amazon is the exact same thing. Amazon doesn't build SEO around what is it that people are looking for? Well, in 2020 and 2021, they're looking for surgical gloves. They're looking for hand sanitizer. They're looking for face masks. So therefore, I'm going to write a lot of content around face masks, and hopefully my e-commerce pages for face masks are going to rank on that. Instead, Amazon said, what is the taxonomy? What is the product structure we build around being able to list and optimize every product in the world? And once they've done that, and going back 20 years, of course, how do you layer on more features? How do you make it more searchable? And then with that understanding, we can think about how these other brands I have on this slide have done the exact same thing. Expedia, Expedia builds city pages very programmatically around every single city, every single hotel in the entire world. I don't know if you're familiar with Zillow in Europe, but Zillow has built a product page, or which is essentially an address page for every address in the entire United States. There isn't search volume around every address in the entire United States, but through that, they're able to optimize for what's essentially tail search. And then from there, they're able to rank on and be visible for what becomes head search in their category, which is real estate. And these other brands have done the exact same thing. And I've thrown Facebook on here because Facebook actually does drive a significant amount of search traffic. According to SEMrush, 60% of their traffic is non-branded search traffic. And what's that from? That's not from random conversations. That's from Facebook building a structure around how do their users build group pages so they get search traffic? How do their users build business pages so it gets search traffic? So the focus for SEO around for them was around building an ideal product and let it be popul populated by their users. When you focus on SEO from a, a product standpoint, instead of thinking about individual search keywords, individual search monthly search volume, you start thinking about TAM, which is total addressable market. So instead of me thinking, how many people search for the keyword car insurance or auto insurance or <coughs> however you want to say it per month, instead I'm saying, thinking about how many people are there in the world or in my locale that would be a customer for my product? How many people need car insurance? So say it's in the US, there's 100 million people that are going to need car insurance. What's attainable for me to eventually get from a search standpoint? And therefore, here's what I'm going to invest in. And that is going to be my North Star. I have never seen a keyword forecast become accurate. Your TAM doesn't need to be accurate either. It just needs to present an investment case. So when you're building a search product, you need to say this could potentially reach if I got to 100%, 100 million people. But if I got to 1%, that's a million, which is just fantastic also. So that's how you start modeling out what your growth should be and what the SEO product should be. And then thinking about how long does this take? So whenever there's an SEO forecast, they're always like, well, it could take about two weeks until it gets crawled and then maybe six months until we're visible. And then it'll take 18 months before I'm on page one. That is completely inaccurate either. Product teams build and say, well, what are the stages we need to go through? We need to spec this out. We need to hire the designers. We need to hire the content writers. We need to build all these pieces. So when you're pitching an SEO product to your boss, to your clients, to yourself, you're thinking about building a product. And I must say, the longer it takes you to build this actual product, the more of a sustainable moat you build against your competition because they also need to go through this entire process. And if you look at the examples I had on the prior slide of companies that built this, they have no competition. They built an amazing product that is almost impossible to catch up to. There is no company that is close to have building what TripAdvisor has built. There is no company that is close to building what Facebook has built on the small business standpoint. So the, the better product you can build, the longer it takes to go and launch this, and then it starts percolating and marinating in search, the better and the more of a moat you will have. But when you think about it, don't say, well, put Google into the picture, think about, what are the stages I need to go through to launch and build an effective product? And for anybody that's worked at a really large company, products take a very long time and that's okay. From a link building perspective, stop thinking about domain authority and stop thinking about metrics like digital PR. Start thinking about just straight up PR. 
how do we get people to talk about what it is that I'm building? Because it's interesting for what people want to write about, what the media wants to write about. Some of those links will matter. Some of those links won't matter. But what, what should matter is, are they in places where people are going to click and are you going to get visibility? From a domain authority perspective, I have been fortunate that I have received links at the companies I work for, not my own self. That would be amazing if I did it on my own websites, that I've gotten links from the uh, EU parliament. I have gotten links from the White House on multiple times. I have gotten links from uh, the largest corporations in the world. And most of those times, those links didn't do anything for me. Like the links I got from the White House, I didn't see any measurable impact from those links. The links I got from the EU parliament, no measurable impact from those links. Because like I, I mentioned, so showed earlier, Google has AI and they can say, well, the White House in this, in one of the cases, stole a, a blog post from the company I was working for. And Google was able to say, well, that's duplicate content. It's not interesting. No one reads it. So therefore it doesn't matter. Therefore the link doesn't count from an AI standpoint. But from a domain authority standpoint, that link looked really, really amazing. So stop focusing on that and start thinking about PR in general. You've built a product. How do you get people to see it, talk about it, and click on it? Because that is how you generate sales, not from getting domain authority. You generate sales from people viewing the product. So hopefully I've given you a little bit of a taste uh, of the way I approach SEO and the, what product-led SEO should be and, and how you can scale growth. And let's dive into the questions. But in the meantime, here's my email address. Uh, that's my website. Can't promise it's as updated as I want it to be. And there's a mailing list, which uh, I will eventually have a bigger, better cadence of sending out emails. And of course, if this is of interest to you at all, you can check out the book and look forward to all questions. Thank you, Eli. Um, yeah, like I said, um, I read your book twice already. <laughs> oh, wow. It's more um, than I've done. <laughs> <laughs> I think you probably since you wrote it, you know what's <laughs> what's in it. And um, I, I really liked your product led approach. Um, I mean, most of the time, um, search engine optimization, um, the companies don't even know where to put it. It's uh, like you wrote, um, it's either in marketing or in product management or in, in the IT sector or, or, or. And um, well, you wrote that since you since you call it product led SEO, it, it should be in the product team. And um, in your book, you use some agile words, if I put it like that, like um, releases and iterative uh, development and so on. And um, yeah, so my first question is where would you put the SEO expert um, in a, if you take it in an agile team? Should it be like the product owner, the scrum master, a developer if the, the, um, uh, if the SEO expert can um, develop <laughs> or like a subject matter expert? So I would, I would have the SEO person be the product owner because that the, when you separate SEO and it becomes more of a, Let's say you separated SEO and, and you had a, the way most companies do it. SEO is on the marketing team. So the, the SEO becomes like the designer. They have input on something, but that input sort of doesn't shape the ultimate product. It just kind of designs it. It, it, uh, it layers on some seasoning on it. Now, I don't think that's right. If you're building something for a search user, then that, that SEO should be the product owner. And you don't need SEO expertise. I don't think you need to have a great understanding of Google. You need to be a product person and have a great understanding of the user and how this should work and satisfy the user's demands. Um, in your book, you wrote, um, understand who it is that pays you. And um, you're referring to the customer, of, of course. Um, so if I think about it, usually when I'm an SEO in a company, it's usually everyone thinks they know how the customer <laughs> works and goes through the pages. Um, how would you um, yeah, describe what uh, the SEO person should do if they want to, to get away, what to, to get the things pushed through if um, there's like backslash from the development team, for example? 
Uh, so the, the problem is where the SEO person is usually sitting. So they, they don't have influence over the developers. So if the SEO person would sit in the product team, they would have influence over the developers because that develop the, the product team will sort of own the developer's time from a, from a resource standpoint or some of the developer's time. When they sit on the marketing team, they're more in a position of filing tickets and making requests. So depending on where you sit, and let's assume that they sit in the marketing team, so they have no actual power and the developers think they know more, the product people think they know more. So in my book, I talk about using diplomacy. The more you can put yourself into the shoes of the product owners, the more you can put yourself into the shoes of the developers by earning their respect, by earning their favor, the better you'll, they'll be able to do favors for you. And then they can realize that maybe you actually know something. So in my book, I began with a story where I, I, on my very first week at SurveyMonkey, I, I made a, a request to an engineer and the engineer told me that marketing doesn't get to tell engineering what to do. Now, I, I worked at SurveyMonkey for almost seven years. This person only stayed there for another two or three years after that. But by the time he left, we were good friends. We'd had many lunches together. So I earned his respect enough to the point where he would began to come to me and, and looked at me as an expert. And the way I did that was by understanding his pain points understanding how he earned credibility within the company, understanding how he got bonuses and, and how he wanted to look. So that's just diplomacy. So it, the, if you want to like throw down and say, well, I'm the SEO expert and I demand that you do that, you don't earn any friends. If you go and say, well, I uh, understand that the, this is the way you think and I'm willing to go along with it, but I hear it's a different opinion and maybe one day we'll be close enough friends that you go along with my opinion and realize that it's a long game you'll be a lot more successful. That's true. <laughs> um, and you um, also say that, of course, if you say SEO is a product, you need a product-led strategy and um, you need to have this product market fit. But on the other hand, you talk about this um, blue ocean like and companies like Amazon who just came to a market that didn't really exist. So they they yeah they thought they have this market fit and of course they had <laughs> but do you have any ideas how you can like try to get your your knowledge if your product will fit the market and so i i, I know i went through my slides very quickly and hopefully gave everyone a taste but uh, going back to the slide where i talked about the surveys and the customer support and the customer data i think there's a couple other ways, but let's let's dig into the surveys, customer support, and the customer data for a second. So, if you've done a survey, I think you do it from a product from a product manager standpoint, where you have as many qualitative questions as possible, not quantitative questions. So, say we're say we use the insurance example, and hopefully insurance resonates for enough people in Europe. I know Europeans are very into travel insurance. I don't know how into uh, car insurance that Europeans are. But from a travel insurance standpoint, say you have a, a new innovation around travel insurance and, and you know hopefully people start traveling next year. So you have a new innovation. So instead of going to a, a user and say, here we, here's how much, uh, here's my travel insurance. These are the features. Would you like multiple choice? Which ones would you add? Talk to actual users and say, when you choose travel insurance, why would you choose the most expensive one? Why would you choose the cheapest one? what's most important to you in travel insurance and you understand what users look for what and then ask them how they find travel insurance do they learn about travel insurance from their family from their friends or do they google it do they spend time shopping for it do they use their phones do they use a tablet do they use a computer so qualitative questions and again that doesn't have to be with an actual survey that could be with going on the street and just randomly talking to people from a customer data standpoint if you're already in the insurance business you can look where, what are the, are people buying the most expensive plan and you don't know why? So that might indicate to you that there's something there to dig into more. Are people uh, from a customer support standpoint, are they writing in emails asking about specific, specific features? Do you cover, um, you know, helicopter evacuations if there's a terrorist attack, but that's not something you featured on your, on your site that might indicate that you should build more into 
uh, content around evacuations, around terrorist attacks. So like that's where you start informing yourself. Now, the other places I would start informing yourself, you don't have access to those three, Reddit. Reddit is the most amazing place to learn more about any sort of category. I don't know why people go and write thousand word answers on Reddit, but they do. So if you're in the insurance space, go and look for those thousand word answers where people pour out their thoughts on, on what it is that you should create. Those are ideas around content. Quora, same idea. What are the questions people are asking? What are the answers that people are giving? What can you provide more information on? And then there are many, many other forums which don't do great SEO and you can really learn more about that. There are many sites that actually go in and they specifically take the Reddit questions and take the Reddit answers and they get more traffic than Reddit. So lots of places to build ideas and find those blue oceans. And then once you find it, you've unlocked a tremendous amount of growth. I mean, I, I always um, do sometimes, well, I do the, the customer service just to get some input and to get feedback from the customers uh, that we have. And I think most of the time it's very interesting to see where they have problems on the page and on the site and what they don't understand because you're you have like this this look and you're so focused to something that you don't know this kind of problem exists so <laughs> that's always interesting to to go out and to ask the people and um, we have one um sebastian stepanovic wants to ask you a question uh, he is unmuted and so, Sebastian. hi, girls and guys. <laughs> hi, Eli. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you for your great presentation. Um, I myself been like more than fifteen years in SEO business, but more or less in online marketing focused business since five years. And I was wondering, um, where do you see the role of product managers? You already talked a bit about it, but uh, more than that, where do you see the role of brand managers in product-led SEO projects? So, but can you like define the kind of company that has a brand manager? Well, every company should have one, <laughs> if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were focusing on SEO as the product lead, um, but um, I don't don't share that experience in companies that I worked for. Oh no, it's not. It's very rare. <laughs> be, be, yeah, because you have like really technical SEOs, and you have more like content SEOs, which are mutating to to content uh, managers. And um, all the things that you've stated, it like it does smell like a really good uh, marketing project where SEO just offers a framework in order to be successful in Google, but all the other uh, people need to do their their part of the work in order to make the whole thing successful. Right. No, so, so I'm coming from Silicon Valley, where right? there are very, there are very few brand managers. Um, it's more of a product manager standpoint. But I, I think most companies SEO is not within uh, product management. It's more in the marketing function, and I think it has less ability to really shape growth. They become like, like I said earlier, like they're seasoning it. They're like, okay, here's how you're going to do the title tag. Here's the content roadmap. But they're not really informing the way SEO should grow. The companies that are most successful at it, like Amazon actually has SEO within product. Zillow has SEO within product. Uh, Yelp had SEO within product. So like, as you build these things, that's where you can say, well, this is how I'm going to market with my organic strategy. And then we're gonna shape everything around that. When it's in marketing, it becomes an after effect kind of effort. So most companies do not have it. And I don't think they do it successfully. Uh, I know in my own consulting, I don't like when marketing teams hire me because they end up without any power. There was, um, I was talking to a, a chief digital officer at a public company who wanted to hire me to help out with SEO. And I asked him how many engineers he had that were resourced to the project. And he said, well, there's none directly resourced, but the CEO is very interested in SEO and we will get engineers. And uh, I, I told him that we, will not be successful at SEO until we get actual engineers and that project did not go forward. So you can't have a bunch of ideas and then leave it in a, in a PowerPoint, which unfortunately SEO agencies end up doing. You actually have to have 
a roadmap and say the engineers, the engineers are sitting and waiting and ready to do that. In marketing, they don't have engineers sitting waiting to do that in product, they do. So I think companies will be more successful at organic growth if SEO sits in the right place. Unfortunately, in most companies, they don't. That's right. Um, in your book, you wrote, um, the paid team must only defend their budgets, not their words. And um, <laughs> in contrast, the SEO team, they are the, the cheap team, <laughs> but usually um, they have to defend everything that they are doing if, because you don't see it right away. And um, yeah, like uh, we, we had uh, Tendai Wiki uh, some month ago and he wrote, if a company wants to be um, successful and to want to do new stuff and to innovate, um, you always should ask yourself, how fast can you uh, get, or how fast can you um, being fired? <laughs> so um, <laughs> he, he said it like, you need to be you or you have to you need to have a safe environment to to do something else and to to not um, depend on vanity metrics so um like you you all, all like you wrote too in your book it's like most people go only for or seos go for keyword rankings so you you have this written keyword set and you try to get more and more keywords into the top 10 for example but he, no one even sh looks if it works. So um, you you already or, um, you you said it um, a bit. But what is the the best metric for an SEO team for you to get um, measured? Revenue. So I I love that you brought this up. And I actually had a conversation recently with a client who this client generates ten billion dollars a year in revenue and total for the whole company. And 20% of that revenue is coming from SEO or organic, right? So like some of it's direct, which means $2 billion. So now when I come in and say, well, here's what our SEO budget should be. We're going after a $2 billion opportunity. We're getting a, a lot more visibility than if we come in and say, well, what are you, what is the SEO team doing? Well, we have this list of keywords and we're going to build content for this list of keywords. And then we're going to, uh, in six months, we'll be at position nine. And this is what our click-through rate is going to be. And then at the end of the day, here's how many visits we're going to have. We're going to have like, you know, 150,000 visits. Aren't you proud of us? But if instead of we say we're going after a $2 billion opportunity and we're going to every year grow that opportunity by 10%, by 20%, a lot easier to get attention. In my own career, and this is when I worked in-house, I actually generated more revenue than the pay team with a smaller team and with a smaller budget. So the pay team was, they, they bid to break even. So they spent $2 million a month. Their goal was to get at least $2 million a month in revenue back. And if they were getting more than $2 million in revenue, again, revenue, not in, in profits, then they would spend more than $2 million in revenue. Whereas I would spend, you know, I, I had my SEMrush subscription, I had my HREF subscription, and I had four members and four or five members on my team and I generated two thirds of the company's revenue. So if you use revenue as a metric, everything will come to you. If you use keywords as a metric, everyone's gonna have to, in their mind, try to understand, well, how does that translate to revenue? Because obviously we only get paid if there's revenue. Translate it for them. <laughs> That's true. Uh, we have two questions in the chat. Um, I will start with the second one because Ram is asking, um, if you like to share some tools for newbies that can be used for SEO research or keyword research. Yes, uh, Ram, you may have, have missed this earlier, but there, to my two favorite tools for keyword research, number one, asking someone on the street if they are, how would they look for whatever you're looking for? And number two is Google. So go into Google and type whatever you think your product is and whatever you want to be visible for and look what's there and like use your own intuition and say, is there an opportunity for me to write more? What are the related searches? What are the suggested searches? What's, what is the gap? Going to a keyword research tool is only going to do something after the fact. It's telling you what people have already searched, but it doesn't tell you the intent behind that. If you do your own Googling and just search, say, what is the intent? You can say, um, you know, and I love doing this and seeing what Google thinks the intent is, because if the intent changes, 
If Google doesn't believe intent is what you think it is, you will never be visible for it. Doesn't matter what the keyword research tool tells you the monthly search volume is. So uh, intuition and your own brain are my favorite keyword research tools. <laughs> That's true. And you wrote a lot about um, Search Console. Um, and I did some things that you talked about in your book. And um, because I really liked it in, in combination with the vanity metrics, because, um, for example, we got rid of a widget that um, generated impressions, 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 and um, but no clicks. So for me, it was like the first thing that I had to go. Uh, because like um, you don't need a keyword that doesn't generate any clicks and in the search console you see what the customer sees or what the potential customer sees and um, they either can click or they don't yeah um, yeah so the the next question from torsten what if i were to analyze only the word or keyword structure for my topic as i find it in the best web webs website hits after the adverts pages so i think he means how can he find the best um topic for his pages so to to get the most traffic i think but chosen just right if we get it wrong and the best topics i would say uh again you're going to to talk to actual users so this is where I, I think what you're saying is there's too many ads and everyone has that complaint and that's how Google pays themselves. Uh, many times if there's too many ads, it's possible that those ads aren't matching exactly what the users are looking for. So that gives you an opportunity to better you match what the user are looking for. So you talk to those users and find the topic. Um, you know, I, I've worked with a number of e-commerce sites and, you know, sometimes e-commerce sites are given bad SEO advice and they're told to like jam in all a bunch of keywords and, and content descriptions around the, the product, those don't really work because users don't really look for that. If you're looking for a pair of shoes, then you're not going to say when you wear shoes, it goes on top of your sock and goes on top of your foot. Users don't look for like, I need a shoe for my foot. Uh, we know we know where a shoe goes, right? So like I've seen that too often in e-commerce where they're just jamming in keywords. If you want to know what topic to use for shoes, and I know Torsten said I answered about it, I still want to dig into it. You want to know what topic to use for shoes? It's shoes. If it's red shoes, then it's red shoes. If it's basketball shoes, it's basketball shoes. You don't really need to bend over backwards to say, well, basketball shoes are also good for people that are running. If they are not used by people that go running, then no one's going to search basketball shoes for running. If people look for basketball shoes for running, then you combine it. So again, that's an intuition. That's a, a research question rather than a keyword research and an ads question. Yeah. Um, another one from Sebastian. If you would check your SEO competi competitors, which information would be the most important for you and how would you check them? So I, I'd say if you're looking for your SEO competitors, it would really be about who's visible on search for your topic. So I expand my competition to include everyone visible in search. So even if I'm selling e-commerce, but Wikipedia is ranking, obviously Wikipedia doesn't sell the product. I consider them a competitor because they could be potentially taking search. So uh, once you find something, look for, you can use SEMrush, you can use Ahrefs, you can use Majestic, use any of those keyword tools to see who else is showing up on your keywords. But all of them are your competition. And even Google's your competition if it becomes like a Google My Business result or a Google Maps result. So important metrics that you could look at just visibility are they visible on your keywords because that means that or your topic because that means it's something it's harder for you to end up being visible and i have seen this over and over in my career and, and you know uh i think sebastian said he also spent 15 years in seo just because you have the right metrics like you can have better keyword usage you can have a better domain you can have better links and still you won't be ranking where your competitors are who have worse of all of that because Google uses a lot more than the metrics that we think. So if there's competition on a keyword or a topic, don't assume you can overtake them just by lining up your metrics. Okay. One question for myself, uh, because um, to get the best content out there for our customers, I have uh, one uh, content writer, which is Sora. <laughs> and um, 
I'm always um, teasing him because I want uh, texts or the next content that he, he can decide by himself which to write, um, that I wanted to have like regular content. So what do you think? How important is it that I get regular content in any capacity from Sora? <laughs> You mean instead of like uh, putting it all out at once? All at once or one, uh, I don't know, uh, one content uh, like a month later, then a week later, a day later. <laughs> it depends on the topic. So uh, recency is a factor within search. And I've seen this on brand search and personal search, but not on things where recency is, is wouldn't matter to a user. So if it's uh, we're going to explain everything about Agile 100. There's no reason to, to leak it out. You just can benefit from uh, Sora should stay up all night and just pump it all out in one fell swoop because why not? You benefit from it being out there. However, if it's something where there's a recency factor, say we're talking about COVID, then there's uh, Google knows that people want the most updated information. So then there's no reason to put it all out at once because you want to benefit from Sora using his time on a on a regular cadence. So I'd say that's where it matters. Like if you're writing product descriptions, there's no reason to leak it all out. You can benefit from having it out as soon as you publish it. Like I, I've seen this with clients where they're like, well, we want to make sure we publish one per month. I'm like, well, then you missed out on that earlier month because it could have already been visible. So it, it really depends on the, the topic. Okay, thank you. I think we are running out of time. So I'm giving to Sora. Yeah, you know, thank you. And um, maybe a few more, a few more thoughts. Um, we invited Eli because of two things. One, I, we thought the topic of SEO might be interesting to a lot of people, especially coaches, trainers, etc. A lot of them have to optimize their businesses, and this could be a good crash course. The second was we've also always been looking at areas of not, not traditional areas of applying agile principles. And when Helen read your book and uh, we talked about it. We saw that you are using a lot of the principles in regular agile teams, right? And applying them to SEO. And my take was always looking at SEO as a product itself and uh, having a team that then builds that product because, and looking at from a customer perspective, really, really supports that. So thank you a lot, Eli. Um, I hope we'll have more, more chances to, to chat with you in the future. And thank you very much for, for joining us.